Okay, it's time for us to carry on. Okay, let's see the video. Michael Heap. Michael is a polyglot software engineer committed to reducing complexity in systems and making them more predictable. This talk will show you how you're already using future flags in your application without realizing it. Is that true, Michael? It is true. The floor is yours. Thank you. Enjoy. Good afternoon. Now, I'm going to start off by apologizing. Because as you may have realized, I am not Sheldon Cooper. Like, I tried to get him here, but between the, the filming schedules, like, he just couldn't make it. So today, we're going to have Michael Heap present Fun With Flags. And I am sorry about that, but you're all okay with that, right? That's it, that's the enthusiasm I like, yes! Would it help if I told you that I learned all about the Serbian flag, especially for this trip? The oldest Serbian flag dates back to 1233, and it's fairly similar to what we have today. Over time, we've had a few different options. A lot of the, um, the older wartime ones were yellow with red logos. And they kind of lost around that until about 1835, when the Constitution described the Serbian flag as bright red, white, and this word that I'm not even going to try and pronounce, um, it loosely translates to a steelish dark colour. Now, the Constitution was criticised as the flag was very similar to the French revolutionary flag. It uses similar colours, but for me, it doesn't actually look the same. In fact, did you know that for 15 years, this was the flag of France? Like, I'm not even joking. Like, for 15 years, the French had a white flag. It, it was a symbol of purity. It sometimes had a fleur de lis on it when in the presence of the king. And it wasn't until 1830 and the July Revolution when they finally adopted the, the tricolour. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Fun With Feature Flags. Um, this is me being quintessentially British. For those of you that I've not met before, I'm Michael. I'm mheap on Twitter if you want to say nice things about the talk. If you want to say bad things, do not put that on the internet. And I work for a company called Nexmo, where I work as a PHP developer advocate. So it's my job to travel, tell people about Nexmo. Like, just out of interest, how many of you have heard of Nexmo before today? OK, more than I was expecting, and obviously doing a good job. Uh, but today, we're here to talk about feature flags and how they can be useful in your day-to-day -day development lives. There is a plan for this afternoon. Should be able to get through it all in about 45, 50 minutes. Uh, we're going to start off with an explanation of what feature flags are. So if you're not too sure, don't worry about it. We'll go through the concepts. We'll take a look at what they can be used for, the different types of flag that are available. Then we'll take a look at how to implement them in your application, including the all-important question of, should I build it or should I buy it? We'll cover how to deal with flags once they're out in the, world, out in the wild, and that includes how to delete them again afterwards, which is very important. I'll, I'll show a few tips and tricks for working with feature flags that I've learned over the years, and then we'll wrap it all up into a nice little summary that you can take away. Sound good? Come on, what's that enthusiasm? Yes. So, thank you. So, what are feature flags? You might know them by other another name, feature toggles, feature flips, feature gates, feature switches. They're all the same words for a single concept. And that's the ability to separate a code deployment from the actual release of that feature. You can enable the feature for everyone on your own terms, or even more likely, enable it for just a few people to test it before it goes out to the entire world. Feature flags give an organization the ability to reduce risk, iterate more quickly, and gain more control over their application. And they were popularized by the team at Flickr in a blog post about 10 years ago. Since then, they've been adopted quite a lot. They're used by some pretty big companies, a lot of which you may recognize. But the biggest users of feature flags that I've seen are Facebook. Now, this is a screenshot of Facebook's Gatekeeper tool from back in 2012. So this is six years old. And if you've ever used Facebook ads and you can target specific demographics, they can do that 
internally as well for feature flags, but with way more options. Back in 2012, Gatekeeper was executing 500 million checks per second. I can't even imagine how many they're serving today. And whilst feature flags only seem to be about 10 years old if we go by the Flickr blog post, they're not actually that new. Like the fundamental concept behind feature flags, choosing to go down the left branch or the right branch of a code base, like that's been around for almost as long as software itself. And that choice doesn't have to be dynamic. If we go all the way back to the beginning, the 1980s, we're using techniques like ifdef as a compiler preprocessor to say, oh, if I'm developing, compile with this code, otherwise compile with this code. You could choose a build time whether you wanted to use the new algorithm or use the original one. And things became a little bit more complex. We didn't want to do it at build time anymore. We wanted to do it at runtime. So we started adding things like command line flags. We could say, run this app, and I want to use the new algorithm or the old one. But we didn't have to make that choice at build time anymore. We could make that choice when we ran it. And then we took it even further. And today, we have the ability to make these decisions at uh, request time. So we run our application, and depending on the, the context of the request, whether it's a certain user logged in, whether in a certain country, whether it's a certain time, we can decide which code to execute. It's going OK so far. Like, I think I'm doing Sheldon proud. So why do we need use cases? Uh, we know what they are. Why do we need them? Um, as it turns out, there are lots of different reasons to use feature flags. And the first one you're probably already using without realizing it. Your application most likely has an if statement in there that controls access to a piece of code based on the logged in user. It could be an admin panel. It could be functionality that they have to pay for. Guess what? Those are feature flags. You can use feature flags for lots of other options as well. I'm going to give you 10 here. Uh, the second is early access, uh, where you ship a new feature and you enable it just for a few people to make sure that it doesn't crash the server, make sure it behaves correctly. Uh, maybe you just want to employ, uh, enable it for your employees. Or maybe you want to give people the option to opt in to the early features. Maybe you want to say, tell you what, you can have early access on the condition that you accept that there might be bugs. And then those people help you test in production with real-world data sets. The user gets something cool. And in return, they're more tolerant of failures that might pop up. And then once you're through that, you can form phased rollouts. You don't want to just say, yep, looks good, give it to everyone. Like You don't know how it's going to perform in the real world. So you might want to roll out to 10%, 20%, 50% of users. If you're bringing up a new backend, you want to make sure that it can handle the load in the real world. This is a fantastic way to test that. There's no more just crossing your fingers and hoping that things work. And as well as allowing specific users access, you can also block specific users. Um, this may be required if you're operating in, say, different states in the US that have different laws. Whether you're working with alcohol or pharmaceuticals, you might be able to work in some countries, but not others. Or the, the other use case for this, which is my personal favorite, which is the CEO rule, which just disables all new features for the CEO until they're absolutely perfect. Because otherwise, they're going to go in, they're going to click around, they're going to say, it doesn't really work. That's because it's early access. Using feature flags, you can make sure they never see that code. It could be calendar driven. Instead of waiting up until midnight on Black Friday, deploying at 11.59 and hoping it works, you deploy it three weeks in advance. You enable it for your employees, they test, and then automatically when it hits midnight, the feature flag gets enabled, and everyone sees the Black Friday sales. It could be a kill switch. Um, I used to run an operations team, so I love these ones. And these are for when we roll out a new feature to a percentage of customers, everything's looking good. And then it gets to a customer that has a different usage pattern, and everything starts to crash. Everything is on fire. Having the ability to just say, nope, turn that off, that is phenomenal for an operations team, being able to just disable functionality until they can get the platform under control. Uh, this is one that I've never done myself uh, for power users, but I'm really looking forward to trying it out. 
And the idea is that new users and power users on your platform have very different needs. Instead of showing them every single option available, when they first log in, disable most of the features. Just give them the basics, and then when they use that, update their, their feature flags to give them the next step and the next step. Gradually take them through the process to becoming a power user. Life happens. Sometimes the site does have to go into maintenance mode. A great example of this is Lanyard, which used to be a conference directory. And they had a flag that changed their middle words, just ignore API keys and cookies. And that eventually stopped everyone from logging in and made the site read only. And finally, sunsetting a product. Unfortunately, everything has to die eventually. And the best way to do this is to hide it entirely, the feature entirely from new signups and then start cutting off users slowly. So you don't just cut everyone off at the same time. You might say, uh, well, these, this 10% of customers are producing the lowest revenue, so we'll take them off first. And you can use feature flags to disable the feature for specific accounts, whilst giving your larger accounts more time to migrate. So there we have it. 10 use cases for what amounts to is basically a glorified if statement. Now, different feature flags are managed by different people and have different requirements around configuration change. Uh, they also have very, very different life cycles. Um, for example, a toggle owned by the product team has a very different job to a kill switch owned by the operations team. Thankfully, we can group these classes of flag into four different groups. Release toggles, ops toggles, permission toggles, and experiment toggles. The first is release toggles. Uh, they're generally temporary by nature, and they generally don't stick around for much longer than a week or two. Um, sometimes they have to stick around a, a little bit longer, uh, but in general, two weeks is kind of the max. And the toggling decision for a release toggle is typically very static. Um, it's enabled by an official release for your application by the ops team. An ops toggle controls the operational aspects of a production system. Uh, we might introduce one when we're rolling out a new feature that has unclear performance issues, uh, performance implications. We don't know if there are issues yet. Uh, so that the ops team can quickly disable that feature in production if needed. Uh, most of them will be fairly short-lived. Once we gain confidence in the feature, we remove it. Uh, but it's not uncommon to have a small number of long-lived kill switches, uh, which allow them to turn off production features if the environment um, is degraded. Take a company like Amazon, for example. Like They've got a really powerful recommendation engine when you go to the home page. But you know that if you go to Amazon and it's struggling a little bit and it takes a few seconds to respond, the ops team are going to go in and they're going to kill that recommendation engine because they don't really care about recommending products to you. What they care about is you going on, adding things to your basket and checking out. Having the ability to turn off the expensive features when under heavy load is, is essential for any operations team. Moving away from deployment and um, operation management, we have to start thinking about our application's behavior, which brings us on to permissions toggles. And when used as a way to manage a feature which is only exposed to premium users, a permissioning toggle might be very, very long-lived. It might exist for one, two, five years. It may last for 10 years. As long as people are still, you still need to restrict access to a feature, that toggle will be alive. These toggles are highly dynamic since permissions are dependent on the user and maybe even the inbound request. And then finally, to work out what performs best, the team might want to perform some experiments. And experiment toggles work by placing each user into a group and then consistently sending them down the same code path. And that's very important, because if I see one experiment and then I refresh then I see the next, like, I'm just going to get confused. And this technique is commonly used to make data-driven optimizations to things, such as the purchase flow of an e-commerce website, or the call-to-action wording on a button, or the color. 
an experiment toggle needs to remain in place long enough for the data collected to be statistically significant. If you're Google, that might be about 35 seconds. If you're a small e-commerce company, that might be three to six months. They have such a wide range of uh, time frames, you just have to look at what your business use case is and make a decision on it. Here we can see all of those on the graph. They have a different amount of longevity and dynamism, uh, with release toggles being the least dynamic and having the shortest lifespan, because they're used just to get a feature out, and the permission toggles having the large, largest lifespan and being the most dynamic. But for me, the most important difference between all of these is ownership. Each of these flags is owned by a different team, all the way through from your development team through to the product team. Instead of your engineers being the bottleneck, empower everyone to make changes. Don't make the product people come to engineers and say, sorry, do you have time to just enable this feature flag in production? Like, empower them. If they make a change and it breaks things, that's on them. But it turns out that the product people generally know what's best for the business. As well as the different classes of flag, they also have different scopes. And by that I mean they have different ways that the, the flag can be rolled out. The most basic is flags that are just on or off. And these are usually set in a application's config, and they affect every person using your application. This is what you'd use to decouple a deploy and the release of a new feature. When it's time to release to everyone, you just go in, update the config, and everyone starts receiving it. But if you have a feature that you want to test, you may decide to roll it out to a percentage of users. Um, this means that a percentage that you define of your users will receive the new feature, and everyone else won't. If it's a feature that needs a little bit more code when you're rolling it out, you may not want to choose people randomly. You may want to enable it specifically for your, your employees, or a, a QA team, or friends that understand that it's an early access feature. And if you're constantly enabling that same group of people, you can define a group that contains them all and control them as a single unit. Uh, we can enable flags for specific groups, perhaps power users or those that have opted in for a beta program, or maybe it's just a team that pays you a ton of money for additional features that you don't want to give to anyone else. Or finally, we may choose to enable a feature based on the context of the inbound request, and that might include the logged in user's information, the current date, any data we have in config files in the database, we can make a decision based on any data we have available that can provide context to the request. And that's most of the theory done. It's time to start looking at the things we need to consider when we're implementing feature flags in our applications. This is the exciting part. Now, feature flagging is a straightforward concept that becomes difficult to manage on a large scale. It's easy to manage one feature flag by changing a hard-coded value in code or changing the configuration file. But when you've got multiple flags across different environments, it's harder to keep everyone in sync in a compliant fashion. So you have to ask yourself the question, do we build it or do we buy it? The trade-offs for each option depend on your resources, how much time you've got, and your internal expertise. Because an enterprise-ready feature flag system it needs an intuitive dashboard that everyone in the organization can use. It needs access control levels to allow different functions, like developers, QA, product, different access rights. You probably don't want developers changing things in production. You need complex business rules. Can we roll this out to, say, 10% of users in Serbia? Can we enable this feature if they're a group moderator and they have the upload media permission, or they're a group admin? Like you have to start building up these complex use cases. You need cascading flags. Only evaluate this flag if this other flag is also enabled. You need multivariate values, which is just a really fancy way of saying you have multiple options in a single flag. And you can say, put the user in one of three groups. Either show them a big green checkout button, a big orange checkout button, 
or the standardized button, the standard sized button. And that user will always get that, that code path. You need an auditing system for tracking who changed the flag, when they changed it, and most importantly, why they changed it. It has to be fast. Like You could have lots and lots of flag evaluations in a single request. We don't want it to slow down our application. It has to scale to handle millions of flag evaluations across different environments, different traffic distributions. And finally, it needs to be highly available. We can set smart defaults in case the data source isn't available, but that could provide an inconsistent experience to customers, or even in the worst case, break data integrity. If someone starts checking out on one feature, then your, your feature flag system goes offline, and they finish checking out with the default. Like That's going to break, because the data is in the format that the default is, ex is expecting. If you're going to roll your own feature flag system, it needs to be online 100% of the time. So given that list of requirements, what do we do? Do we build or do we buy? Knowing all of that, you may decide to just build it yourself. Like you think, yeah, we've got the resources for that. Now, the gold standard for feature flags is a Redis-backed library written in Ruby called Rollout. It supports user-based, group-based, and incremental rollouts. However, we're PHP developers. Like, a Ruby library doesn't really help us. But thankfully, there is a PHP port of it, which seems relatively well-maintained. It uses the same idioms, the same function names, so it should feel familiar to those that have used the original rollout. And even more importantly, if you find any blog posts about how to use the Ruby version, you can translate those directly to the PHP version. But the real gold standard in the PHP world is Candidate's Toggle. It's a great library that's really, really flexible. Now, this example is all in a single file, but you can create conditions from config files, add in information about the logged in user into your context objects, perform actions in middleware, controllers, views, whatever you need. It all starts off by creating a toggle manager, which keeps track of all of our features and conditions. Uh, this is in memory, so we're going to rebuild this on every request. Then we create a set of two conditions. We say that the value provided is greater than or equal to 18, and less than or equal to 22. And then we run these comparisons against the value in the time key in our context, uh, which we'll get to that in just a moment. We create a new feature, and we say that all of the conditions must be true using the unanimous strategy. And this means that every condition that we passed in has to pass for this feature to be active. Instead of unanimous, we could use the affirmative strategy, which will pass if any of the conditions are true. Or we can use the majority strategy, which returns true if the majority of conditions evaluates true. And this requires more conditions to be true than false. In the case of an equal count, the feature is disabled. So we went in and we defined a feature called disable work email. We passed in a set of conditions, if it's after 6 and before 10. And we said that all of the conditions have to pass. We have a feature flag definition. We, we have to add some context to the request. Like we have a set of rules. Um, but we need to pass in what time it currently is to know whether this feature is active. So we take the current hour um, by using the date function, and we store it in the evaluation context in a field named time, which is the same name that we used when we were defining the conditions. And then finally, we output whatever we need based on if the feature is active for the given time. We give the manager the name of the feature that we want to check, which is how it loads up all of the conditions and we give it a context to evaluate the rules against. In this case, the time is after 6 and before 10. So, hey, everyone's happy. No work emails. Putting it all together, we have a complete feature flag system in just 11 lines of code. But this is just a single feature. Normally, you'd have 
five, ten, a hundred different feature definitions. So you don't really want to have a single PHP file that goes in and defines all of those each time. Defining features as code isn't our only option. We can populate it using an array, for example, which opens up lots of opportunities. Because once we can populate with an array, we can populate using a JSON file or a YAML file. All we have to do is decode it and pass it in. Or you could even load all of your features from Redis using one of the built-in drivers. This one is particularly interesting because it allows you to build tooling to manage your flags dynamically. Your application loads the flags from this data source that it doesn't know anything about. The flags in your application are decoupled. And that means that you can do things like use the candidate toggle API. And what this does is it interacts with Redis for you. So you can update your feature flags in real time but using any tooling that you want. And the next time your application runs, it will pick up the new values for the, for the feature flags. And they give this away. It's free. It's on GitHub. But they even took it one step further. They thought, OK, we've built an API. But let's build a UI on top of that. And this has been deprecated for a while. It's written in Angular 1. I think they got a little bit bored of maintaining it. But it still works reasonably well. You can go in. You can define new features. You can see the state of whether toggles are active, inactive. Uh, you can change the state of things. Right, and all of this is on GitHub. It's all free. You just go on to candidates, um, GitHub organization, and it's all there. Now, assuming we're using candidate, there are a few pros. It's free. It gives you total control over the system. And if it doesn't work for you, you can extend it or modify it as you see fit. And you can build rules that are as complex as you like. Plus, of course, the API and the UI that they make available for you. Uh, there are, of course, downsides. It's free as in money, but not as free as in time. You've got to deploy and maintain additional infrastructure around this. It only supports PHP, so if you have other languages in your stack, you're out of luck. And finally, it supports complex rules. I know this was a positive too, but you can get yourself really tied up with dependent flags and all kinds of different things. Um, so you have to be careful when you've got complete control over how you're implementing things. The other option is buy. If you decide no, actually building something and keeping it online is too much for me, just go ahead, buy it. There are a couple of options. Uh, Rollout.io is one. Um, Launch Darkly is the one that comes to mind for me, thanks to the work of the developer advocate Heidi. Um, Launch Darkly is a feature flags platform in a box, and it provides everything you can do and more. Uh, the first thing that it's not just PHP, it support Java, .NET, Python. Node, Ruby, Go, iOS, Android, and of course, PHP. It comes with a pre-built dashboard that shows you the current state of all your flags, the short feature names, when they were last used. It's environment aware, so anytime you create a flag, it's automatically created and usable in every environment you have. With Candidate, you'd have to deploy one for production, one for staging, one for dev. With Launch Darkly, you create a feature flag, and it gets deployed to all of those automatically. And it definitely scales. They, say they serve over 20 billion feature flags per day to companies of all sizes. Microsoft, Atlassian, CircleCI, just to name a few that you may have heard of. And of course, they have a comprehensive audit log. And you can read through it sequentially, search by date, by flag, or even specific fields. And this makes it really easy to find out when your latest feature was enabled for teams of up to 20 people, when you only really wanted it to be enabled for teams of up to 10, you go and see who changed that, when they changed it, why they changed it. And finally, they have great multivariate support. With Candidate, you can do multivariate tests, but then you have to track the, the conversions yourself. Like You can show three options, but then you've got to capture the data who actually interacted with those options yourself. With Launch Darkly, as well as just returning a value for a multivariate flag, you can use the SDK to trigger a conversion, letting you know how well each variant is performing. And they give you a nice little dashboard that shows, uh, well, we showed option A to 300 people, and 210 of them clicked on it. 
versus the 300 people we showed option B to, but only 70 clicked on it. Now, it must be really inefficient, right? Like to load all of those feature flags from a third party site? Like every single page load, PHP rebuilds the world, so we've got to get our flags from somewhere. Launch Darkly was originally intended for long running processes to keep the feature flags in memory. Uh, but they realized that the PHP community is a massive market. So now they provide LD Relay, which is a daemon that runs continuously. Um, it keeps flags in memory and it connects to LaunchDarkly's streaming system. So anytime you change a flag on the LaunchDarkly website, that gets pushed out over the stream to LD Relay. And the next time your PHP application runs, it gets the new flags. Uh, because you run LD Relay locally, it could be on the same box as your application, which means the, the communication overhead of fetching these flags is minimal. Like, it's basically the same, if not quicker, as storing them in a database. Not only does this reduce latency, but if LaunchDarkly goes offline for any reason, you still have your local cache of the most recent flag state, which shouldn't be underestimated. So, why should we buy? Like, I love their dashboard. Like, it's really, really nice to work with. It shows you so much information in quite a concise manner. It's multi-language. If you're working with PHP and Node and you've got an iOS app, you can use LaunchDarkly for all of those. It's got a built-in audit log, which is really, really important. It's environment aware. You don't have to deploy for staging and production and dev. You just create a flag once and it appears in all of them. And it has built-in A-B testing conversion tracking. It does cost. Like, it's at least $79 per month, and that's for 10,000 unique users, which most people can work with. Um, in LaunchDarkly, a user is a concept of you have a unique user and you define flags for that user. So it's not 10,000 visits. It might be 10,000 logged-in users to your application which if you've got that, you might be able to pay more than $79 a month. For me, thinking about how much a developer costs and how much time they'd have to put in maintaining a server um, and installing and maintaining this, $79 seems fairly reasonable. But the other two might be deal breakers. You have no control of the product, both from a features perspective and a stability perspective. But Given that people like Atlassian are using them, I think you're in fairly good hands. So given all of that information, should I build it or should I buy it? This is a hard choice. Like, you can go either way. But the answer is it depends. It always depends. If you're going to use your system heavily in creative ways, then I'd recommend building your own. Otherwise, just pay the experts to handle it. Use the rest you care get on with building your actual business. No matter which option you go for though, the code is going to look very similar. And these examples use candidates toggle and symphony, but the examples translate to every framework. When you're using feature flags, there are only really three decision points. The first, is at the controller level, because maybe you want to limit access to a controller. And here, the profile controller will return a 404 unless the profile management flag is available. And this is using the candidate symphony bundle, so you don't have to write anything, it's all just available for you. But maybe the control level is a little bit too high. Maybe you want to limit access to just a specific method. Maybe you're deploying a new feature you want to limit access to that method in the controller. Or maybe you want to use a brand new controller for some users, but have everyone else use the old one. You intercept the routing engine. You say when you get a request, when you load which controller to load, take a look at this, this other value that I've defined called alt. Take a look at the, the value in flag. And if that flag is active, send them to the alternative controller instead of the default one. The second option is in your views. 
Maybe your features are more granular than switching out an entire controller. Maybe it's just a small section of a view that you need to change. Uh, you can use a twig function to decide what to do in your views. Here, if the feature is active, we show a new image picker. Otherwise, we use the old flash-based one. And the final pinch point is a factory. Depending on whether a flag is active or not, you get a different instance of you get an instance of a different class. And this returns new objects, but you could do this using a container, and you can inject dependencies in depending on whether a flag is enabled or not. It's really about deciding when you build up your objects, you build up their dependencies, inspecting the flags and deciding what gets fed in as a dependency. So there are three pinch points for applying new feature flags at the controller level, at the view level, and in factory methods or configuration. And that's how you implement feature flags. You choose to build it or you choose to buy it. And once you've made that decision, the rest is relatively easy. It's just if statements. Now, we have all of these flags. How do we manage them? And there are a couple of ways to handle it. Uh, the easiest option is just to hard code values in your application, set a constant in your bootstrap file, and change it whenever you need. That works, but it's not great, if I'm honest. And the next step is to define those values in the config file instead. It's better, not by much, because you still have to release your application to change the value. You still have to risk pulling in new code just to enable or disable a feature which leads to parameterized config. And this allows you to, to edit the config in production and see the changes take effect immediately. You don't have to ship new code. And you can achieve this with tools like Puppet or Chef or just a friendly ops person that logs into a server by hand and changes the value for you. But if you want to th make things even more dynamic, we can read features from the database. And this means that we can provide a UI that allows people to toggle features on and off. They don't have to talk to ops anymore. But this isn't very efficient, because each time a page loads, your application hits the database and builds up your feature state. You start to hit your database very hard, unless you start to cache the features in memory, and maybe using something like APC. But this starts to cause issues as well, because you might update a flag, and each local cache expires at different times providing an inconsistent experience to your users. If they hit one server and it's expired and they hit another one and it hasn't, right, they're going to get a different experience. But there is a solution. The solution is distributed configuration. And thanks to tools such as Console or Zookeeper, uh, what you can do is define your features in a key value store, which your application can query on startup, and then cache locally. And caching locally caused those issues before. Um, but Console and Zookeeper have a concept named Watches, which allows your application to sign up for notifications when values change. So when they start, they can say, give me all the feature flags. I'm going to cache them. And then when a value changes, Console will notify all of your application instances and say, hey, there's a new value. Expire your cache altogether and re-request the new values. If you have any feature flags in your application, you're going to want a feature dashboard. Right? Trust me on this. Because it's nice to see all of the available flags along with the date that they were added, the percentage of traffic going to them. And you can use that to feed into your flag retirement plans, because we do want to delete them eventually. For me, the main reason for having a dashboard is to control access to flags. Many companies choose to give different members of the team different, different visibility, different levels of access um, to certain environments or different flags. Um, one example would be to lock changes to the production environment to anyone not in the operations or the product team. Because when it comes to rights to change a user's subscription, for example, like that can cost them real money. Like it has the potential to be destructive. So you want to control access to different aspects of your feature flag system. By making users authenticate into a dashboard, you can build an audit log of state changes. 
And this can help you solve the question of who made the change. And if you require a change message, it can also help with why was this change made. And finally, it empowers non-technical users. Feature flags are most effective when they're in the hands of the product team. Figure out how to get the power out of the hands of your developers into the hands of your product team, because it reduces a major bottleneck in feature control. But make no mistakes. A feature flag is technical debt. In fact, if there's one thing that feature flags should not do, it's live long and prosper. It makes your, code harder, your code's execution harder to reason about. It makes the code harder to read and harder to maintain. Code in general is a liability, so having two options for a single flag is an even bigger liability. And we can use our dashboard to help us delete all flags. Just knowing whether a flag is active is very helpful in knowing if we can delete it or not. And on your dashboard, show the last time the feature was toggled or the percentage of users currently using it. This is a clear sign that a feature rollout or experiment is complete. And it's an easy way to audit which flags need retirement. Look for flags that haven't been modified in over 30 days. Uh, for flags that are for feature release or experimentation, that's a good sign that the work is done and you can remove it. Um, a good tip is to tag your release flags with either long term or short term. So you can say, OK, this one hasn't been toggled in 40 days, but it's a long term flag, so we should leave it in there. But one of the best ways to handle feature flags is to create a pull request, removing it at the same time that you create a PR, adding it. It's because you understand exactly what the flag is doing, and it makes removing it as easy as just merging a pull request. Limit the number of flags per team as well. If you turn around to your product manager and say, we're going to have four or six or 20, oh, sorry, not say to them, agree with them. We're going to have five, 10, let's call it 10. We're going to have 10 feature flags at any, at any one time. When you get to 10, you could say, no, sorry, we can't add any more feature flags for you. You have to give us the time to remove the old ones. Like, get buy-in. Incent incentivize the people that made decisions, the people that want new feature flags, to also want to remove them. And working progress limits are a really good way to handle that. Before you launch a feature flag, I decide on the date to retire it. And that can be used to generate email reports, visual dashboards, big red signs that say, remove this feature flag on a specific date. It's also a phenomenal piece of documentation. Because if you choose an expiry date and then you leave the company, everyone else knows, hey, we're past that date. It's safe to remove, rather than saying, oh, well, Michael added that feature flag, and I'm not sure what it's doing and whether it can be removed. Like, it removes that institutional knowledge. It gives a hard cutoff for when you can remove that flag. And some, some adventurous teams take this to its logical extreme by automatically turning off the flag on its expiry date. And this is feature flags meets chaos engineering. Um, this keeps engineers on their toes because it means that they don't want an instant at 3 AM. They actively remove the flags before the expiry date. Now, it's almost time to wrap up, uh, but I want to show just a few tips and tricks that make my life easier when working with feature flags. Uh, the first one is around testing. And testing feature flags is always a fun one uh, because there are two schools of thought. Um, one is that you should test every combination of feature flags in your application. And the other is that that's not really practical. And testing feature flags with your two combinations, with, sorry, with two feature flags, provides four combinations. Like, that's OK. We can write tests for that. But when we add three feature flags, that's eight combinations. And with four flags, that's 16 combinations. In fact, it only takes 31 flags for us to hit 2.14 billion combinations. Just testing every permutation isn't possible. Like we just don't have the time. But thankfully, it's not as bad as most people imagine, because most feature flags don't interact with each other. And most releases will not inv involve a change to the configuration of more than one feature flag at a time. With this set of flags, uh, some of which interact with each other, we need to cover them with 24 test cases. That's a lot more manageable than the 4,096 cases we'd have to write to test every possible combina uh, combination. 
it's most important to test the toggle configuration, which we expect to become live, which means how production currently is and what production will be like after you enable your features. Expose the feature toggle configuration. Like We've always embedded version numbers so we know what's running in production. The same can be applied with feature flags. Any system using feature flags should expose some way for the operator to discover the current state of a system. And this could be done by sending back HTTP headers, by querying a special endpoint, or just by using a dashboard. Add as much information to your flags as possible. Imagine everything is on fire. It's 3 AM. You need to reduce system load somehow. What would you rather see? Would you rather see this? Or would you rather see this? Basic rec algo is true or use a simplistic recommenda recommendation algorithm, which is fast, produces less load, but it's not as accurate. Like, add as much context as you can to your flags. A flag should have a clear, well-understood name. A flag called user control, like, what does that mean? One team thought it controlled the functionality that they were using, another team thought it controlled theirs. You get that situation where you've got two people at opposite ends of the room, one flicks a light switch and the other one flicks it at the same time, and the lights just keep going on and off. Like, be very specific. Allow user delete, allow user edit, not user control. Now, I know I mentioned this before, but it's really important. If someone is turning a flag on or off, make sure that you know who that is, whether it's an actual human or an automated system. If a flag is causing abnormal behavior, you want to know who caused it, so you can tell them to stop and then debug why the issue happened. Finally, fail safe. Do use flags for positively enabling new features. Do enable the IBM analysis. Do use the enhanced recommendation algorithm. This means that the flag has a true, it has to be set to true in order for it to be visible, and that the default is that they're switched off. Do it this way, instead of using them to suppress new features. Things like disable feature X, disable shiny new feature, because if your feature flag system goes offline, suddenly everyone gets the new feature without you really wanting them to. Which brings us on to the conclusion. Flags are great. Like, that's the conclusion. <laughs> there are four kinds of toggle. Release toggles, which are generally temporary, fairly static. An experiment toggle which is also temporary, but dynamic on user, uh, dynamic based on user. An operations toggle, which is semi-permanent, but fairly static. And a permissions toggle, which is permanent and highly dynamic, as it can change on every request. If you want feature flags, you can build or buy a system. If you want to build, you won't do much better than candidates toggle. And if you want to buy, launch directly is a solid option. But I want to leave you with just one more thing. And that's that you should never, ever, 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 ever reuse feature flags. Like, never. Because how many of you have heard of Night Capital? Uh, a couple of hands. The rest of you, you're in for a treat. Because they were a, they were a high frequency trader that was doing quite well. And back in 2014, they were working on a brilliant new trading algorithm. Like, they've been working on it for months. And they deployed it overnight after the markets closed. And the code started running at 9 AM the following day. And they rapidly went from yes to no, like what's happening here? They started losing money very, very rapidly. Mistakes were made. The first one that they made was that they reused a feature flag. Like they didn't choose a new name. They said, oh yeah, this one's fine. Let's use that. But they didn't delete the obsolete code. It was still in the code base. That's mistake number two. When they enabled the flag, the obsolete code triggered trades in quick succession. And that was, thankfully, only one on one server out of the eight that they had deployed. And they reacted quickly, or at least as quickly as they could do, because the flag, it couldn't be disabled without a deployment. And that was mistake number three. It turns out, though, that when you're losing millions per minute, you start to panic. And in their panic, they got the deploy wrong. And they actually enabled the old, old code on all eight servers. 
That was their fourth and final mistake. All in, $460 million. That's almost half a billion dollars was gone before 10 a.m. Now, Knight Capital could have presented this situation by not reusing a flag, by cleaning up their code, or in what should have been the worst case scenario, by having their flag be turned off separately from a deploy. And with that, we come to the end of the talk. Um, probably not going to have time for questions, but I'll be out at the back if anyone has any. I'm mheap on Twitter. Uh, Next more devs sent me here, and I'd love to hear any feedback you have on the talk or joined in, as would every speaker here this weekend. Um, yeah, I'll take any questions right at the back if anyone's got any. Thank you. Any questions? Questions, 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 questions. Nope. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. I have a question for you. Have any one of you here made any of those paper airplanes over there, up there? No? Anyone? You did. Okay, great. How about other activations? I just want a Bluetooth speaker, and I was just, you know, making my face from. That's nice. Anyway, it's a reminder to, to make fun and to have fun in our activation area. And don't forget to rate our lecturers, because they like it very much. OK. The last, but not the least, as long as we pack Michael. Take it easy. Thank you very much.